This week on This is America and the World, our guest is Ambassador Mohammed Ziauddin. Currently, Ambassador Ziauddin serves as ambassador from the People's Republic of Bangladesh to the United States. Formerly, he served as ambassador to Italy from Bangladesh and was also ambassador at large with the rank and status of state minister. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to your very important uh, interview. Thank you. Um, August 25th, a huge uh, date for you in Bangladesh. Uh, tell us a little bit about what happened then and paint a picture for us now of the refugee crisis in Bangladesh. 25th August, we believe it is a date one should remember as one of the, one of man-made's most cataclysmic uh, days and a dark, part, dark chapter of uh, human history. Mm. On that day, the government of Myanmar uh, in a planned way went into the process of ethnic cleansing. Mm. And that led to the burning of villages, scorching of villages, homes. Thousands of people were killed. Thousands of women and children were raped and hundreds of thousands of people f started fleeing from bullets and bludgeons, so to say. The only place they could get respite was the next door neighbor, which is Bangladesh, and they crossed over in multitudes. It came to such a pass that in the span of slightly over two months, we have now 600,000 refugees in our part of the border. It has to be also taken into consideration the whole process of this ethnic cleansing began in 1978 for the first time. But it was the number was small and we could persuade the Myanmar government to take them back. It again happened in 1982, but this time they came with a uh, Citizens Act by which they disenfranchised the Rohingyas of their citizenship. Then again, the next one was in 1992. At that time, there was a big flow. There were 260,000 who entered Bangladesh. But at that time, through peaceful negotiations and understanding, we could convince them that they are a part of your society and they took them back. So, but later on, uh, that we started seeing every year a certain number of people drifting in, into Bangladesh. So, 2012 was one push, 2015, 2016, and now 2017. Mm -hmm. It seems that it is, like I said before, a very planned strategy to clean the place of this ethnic minority, which is the most persecuted and deprived minority possibly in the whole world. Mm -hmm. The most oppressed, subjugated, having lost their citizenship, they are not allowed uh, to go to schools, no education for them, no health benefits, support, and uh, no jobs. So they live on the land on which they live. And they have been there actually since the 8th century when the Arab traders for the first time came into Myanmar uh, to, to for trading, for trade and commerce. And along with them came other followers. Soon they were followed by uh, by 
Indi from people from India, the Indian, Indian subcontinent. And that means from anybody from north to south, anybody who are interested to do business and uh, uh, have a better life, mm. so to say. And, sorry. Finish, please, Ambassador. Yeah. And then subsequently, uh, the whole thing, uh, in, at one time, British, it was British, British India included Myanmar. And during that time, uh, everything was good for whoever was living there. But in 1947, Pakistan came into existence and Bangladesh was at that time called East Pakistan. And in 1948, Myanmar got independence mm -hmm. one year later. And then, of course, things were okay for some times till the Myanmar government started having this uh, uh, feeling that these people do not belong to Myanmar and they should leave the country. So Myanmar, predominantly a Buddhist country, uh, the Rohingya are uh, Muslim. Why such hate? for uh, this uh, group of people who are poor, uneducated, trying to just live their lives, huh? But there's hate there, isn't there? The hate is possibly not because of religion so much as ethnicity. Ah, ethnicity. I think the rest of, they have got 135 ethnic groups in Myanmar, and all of them are more or less they are similar, uh, but here is uh, one ethnic group who, are, who had migrated several centuries ago with several, with several generations staying in, that, in the country. And they came from the Indian subcontinent and some initially from the Middle East. Mm. So they're different. And these people, when they came, they were good businessmen, good traders, they did well, they prospered, and we have a feeling that maybe it was a reaction uh, against this prosperity and this uh, uh, good living which these people had vis-a-vis -vis the people, the majority in Myanmar. I read uh, 500, 650,000 plus some uh, that were there already. We're close to a million people now, huh? Uh, close to a million refugees. There is a million people. It's a over million. a million right now. If you take the refugees which came earlier, yes. add it to the 600,000 which is here today. A million. It's a million. This has to be a tremendous uh, strain on Bangladesh uh, from the point of uh, cost, uh, risk, uh, security, uh, providing uh, shelter, food. I mean, it has to be a tremendous uh, drain. Uh, could you talk about that for a minute? Well, you know, Bangladesh has been doing very well uh, since 2009 when the present government in Bangladesh came into office under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Uh, in these few years, we have come to the world map uh, as a country which is prospering very well for the least developed countries. We are ahead of many, more, all the least dev developed countries and many lesser developed countries and even some developing countries. Mm -hmm. In the sense that in the last uh, five or six years, our uh, GDP growth was 6.2%. Mm. And uh, at a time when the whole world was going through a process of rec recession, as you very well know, uh, even uh, there was a recession hit the United States here mm -hmm. very badly. But still, we had around 6.2 to 6.5 percent GDP growth. Last year, we crossed the 7 percent mark. It was 7.2 percent. And this year, we expected that it will be 7.5 percent. Our inflation rate has been also restrained. It is 5.8 percent. So it is the the growth is more than the inflation. 
in a situation like this, we were doing very well. A lot of progress, a lot of development. The socioeconomic in indicators have been most remarkable. The UN agencies, which are all have their offices in Bangladesh, are very happy with the way Bangladesh is going. Mm. And the United Nations former Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, used to say that Bangladesh is a role model for economic development. Mm. And other countries should look at Bangladesh and see if they can follow Bangladesh's. So you're saying that uh, with that growth and um, development, you're able to still be hospitable to the refugees? What I'm saying is that this takeoff stage of Bangladesh has been disrupted by this appearance of 600,000 refugees in a span of two months, which has never happened anywhere in any part of the world in recent human history. Mm. Let's hold on that note. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we will uh, take a little break, uh, talk to the folks at home and tell uh, them if they're just joining us. We're talking with the uh, ambassador from uh, Bangladesh to the United States. Uh, we're learning about the refugee crisis, but also, more importantly, learning about the country of Bangladesh, which uh, many of us know uh, very little at all. So uh, sit tight. Back on the other side, this is America and the World. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, John and Mary Papajohn, the American Hellenic Institute, the U.S.-China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President, the National Hellenic Society, preserving Hellenic heritage in America, Katerina Panagopoulos, the Barakis Foundation, the League of Arab States, the Rotondaro, Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Mr. Ambassador, before we leave the refugees, uh, just one quick question. Is there any good news on the horizon? Uh, we wanted immediate stoppage and to the violence which is taking place, which is still taking place even now, which is making more and more people come to our part of the country. We want that to stop. Unfortunately, it is still continuing on. But the good news possibly is that we are getting uh, international attention, international support. United States has been very generous. They came up with hundred and four million dollars and uh, on the 23rd of October just a couple of days back uh, in Geneva there was a pledge conference which came up with uh, three over three hundred and twenty five million dollars so uh, but the f the important thing to note is that this money they know they have calculated will probably end by the 28th of, of February. Mm. So we'll need more aid and assistance to come to flow into Bangladesh. Uh, another quick question, because this is such an important issue. Uh, do I understand correctly that there's some behind the scenes uh, conversation, talks, between Bangladesh and Miramar about the Rohingya going back at some point? One of our policy has been that we should have a good, friendly relationship with our neighbors. So we have the best relationship with India, which is actually, you know, we have a common border of 2,545 miles. And then Myanmar, with whom we have 168 miles common border. And because of our good relationship with both our neighbors, we were able to solve 
many problems. With India, we solve the boundary problem, with and the maritime problem. With the Myanmar, we solve also the maritime problem, the territorial problem which we had in a very amicable fashion on the basis of decision which was given by international courts. So we continue to maintain good relationship and through good relationship and good conversation, we were able to send back these refugees back to Myanmar in the past. Mm. At least a significant number of them. So that's the hope for the future? And that, with that, that is the hope for the future. And we believe, we believe in engaging in talks and talks have already started. A delegation had come and met our foreign minister uh, some days back. And our home minister is uh, on way to Myanmar to continue the talks. So we believe that this can be resolved if we sit and we talk uh, with reason and sanity. We can take, send these people back to their own heart and home. Mm. Uh, you've mentioned the relationship with uh, India, with uh, Burma. Uh, Pakistan, of course, we know a uh, piece of the pie here. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, population of uh, Bangladesh is how many people? 160 million. Uh, my understanding, it's uh, con incredibly densely populated. In an area of 56,000 square miles, you can compare it with Iowa, which has a population of 4.1 million but we have 160 million. In this area? In this area, with 2,000 people per square mile. Mm. Population, uh, 160 million. Uh, the capital is? Dhaka. And how many people are in that area? About, we, are, we estimated at around about 16 to 18 million. Mm. Uh, I read that uh, 700 rivers 5,000 miles of inland waterways, uh, a coastal beach line that goes on forever. So the country has to be very vulnerable to flooding, huh? And that's been a big problem. You see, <clears throat> we have three priorities for this government. This government, uh, and one number one has been poverty, yeah. two has been terrorism, and third is climate change. But climate change I'm saying as number three because it is a long-term uh, proposition. So soon after our prime minister assumed office in 2009, she went to, to a number of international conferences telling them about climate change and the adverse impacts it is having on Bangladesh. Bangladesh, as you very rightly said, it is a land of thousand rivers, they say. The people have through ages have lived in this deltaic region. Mm -hmm. But if we have seen in a few decades from since a couple of decades, uh, there has been the frequency of floods and frequency of cyclones. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, our people are resilient. They have seen, experienced, they have lost lives. And through the years, they have been able to come up with some indigenous adaptation and mitigation measures. Mm. We like building polders, embankments, forestations, for, you know, I mean, planting trees and all that, and the even cyclone shelters. But the fact remains that this is something we know that there is something more uh, foreboding is there in the f for the future. Mm -hmm. Because uh, scientists have said that if there is one degree increase, one degree centigrade increase in temperature, it will lead to one meter rise in water, which is going to actually inundate or submerge one fifth of Bangladesh. Whoa. That will lead to migration of 25 to 30 million people. And if they migrate northwards, then you can well imagine the cities and the towns in the north, they'll be burgeoned with tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. 
and that could be social disorders. Mm. Mm -hmm. So climate change, poverty, and security. Security. Let's go for a minute and talk about the economy, uh, which you have painted a good picture, uh, a developing country. Um, we know Bangladesh textiles, we would know. What are some of the other uh, drivers of the economy in uh, Bangladesh? It is uh, the export of apparels, of course. Mm -hmm. And then we have other exports, mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceuticals, yes, uh, which is exported to nearly 90 countries of the world, ceramics, which goes to around 80 countries of the world. Then there are, of course, you know, uh, uh, shipbuilding, which is taking place in Bangladesh now. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, foreign uh, investors who have invested in shipbuilding. So this is another area. And then in there is ICT, Information and Communication Technology, mm -hmm. which has made Im amazing growth. Mm -hmm. In a country of 160 million people, we have got 130 million subscribers who have got mobiles and 60 million internet users. So you can well imagine uh, every nook and corner of Bangladesh act is actually under cover of ICT. Mm. Uh, so uh, these, are, these are some areas. Then we have about, uh, about 10 million people, expatriates all over the world. They are sending in remittances. Uh -huh. So the remittances have been increasing. It is now about $15 billion mm -hmm. a year. The exports have also increased because of our diversity which is taking place. It has gone up to about 34 billion mm -hmm. last So year. trading partners would be Asia, Europe, United States. United huh? States. Uh -huh. I know that in your country, and this was evident uh, recently at a wonderful event at your embassy, uh, culture, music, literature, dance, very important to the people of Bangladesh, huh? In the entire subcontinent of India, or as I say, the subcontinent, or the Indian con Indian uh, subcontinent, Bangladesh is is uh, is located in the southeast corner of of the continent, and uh, uh, it is the, the 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 area is called the Bengal region of India, mm -hmm. but we comprise the major part of the Bengal region, and as you said, you know that you indicated, it's all these rivers and streams, mm -hmm. the water. So the people of the country, I believe, this environment has had its influence in developing the character and the, say the genetic evolution of the people in, in a different direction. Uh. And that is being, you know, the, having so many rivers and streams and all that and flooding, the land is very fertile. So people would just throw, you know, seeds, grains of seeds, and next morning they would probably see crops. Uh, the coming. agriculture is so important it's there. It's huh? important. And that's why they had enough to eat and live by, and they had concentrated or focused their life on mental pursuits. Ah. And that is where, you know, you will find that Bengal is a place where people love music, songs, most of them are poets, or they can all sing a song, or you know they are they they are literate, they are they are into literature, and we are proud to say that in the entire subcontinent, in 1913, Ramindranath Tagore, he is from Bengal, and he won the Nobel uh, laureate, he won the Nobel Prize for literature mm. in 1913, when actually it was the European languages were dominant. Mr. Ambassador, we are just at the end of our time. I know that uh, your mission uh, as ambassador here is uh, one of the things is a fairness as far as trade is concerned, fairness as far as tariffs and such. And uh, I know that we support you in your mission. We thank you so much thank for you. being with us on this uh, very important program to learn about Bangladesh. Thank you for having me here. Thank it you, was a Ambassador. great pleasure. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
For information about This is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is brought to you by the Libra Group, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, John and Mary Papajohn, the American Hellenic Institute, the U.S. China Education Trust and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The National Hellenic Society, preserving Hellenic heritage in America. Katerina Panagopoulos. The Barakis Foundation. The League of Arab States. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.